text our final selection before our preach word on this morning. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus. It's a kind of a medley there of two songs. Ephesians 2 and 13 gives our scripture reference for this. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. He who were once far off. You know who was far off? You and I, right? Gentile people. This Bible says, even looking at it geographically, they were far off. And then spiritually, we were far off. But amen. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. We're going to read in just a moment further in Ephesians how Christ came and tore down that petition. Amen. And gave us access. So nothing but the blood of Jesus and holy.
ready this morning now for our sermon, our message. If you will, if you have Ephesians in your Bible, where Remington just read from, we're going to go back there. We're going to be looking at uh, a little more of that Ephesians chapter two. Of that. 
the scripture that we read on this morning. The Lord speaks and confronts his people and shares with them that he wants them to come to him. That any sacrifices that are sacrificed must be done in my presence, not out in the fields and all this other kind of stuff. As he said, they ran or played the harlot or prostituted after these goat idols and other things. And he not only says for you, but he says in verse 8, he says, tell the people this in Leviticus 17 and 8, if any citizen of Israel or foreigner or stranger living with you offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, that person must take his sacrifice to the entrance of the meeting tent to offer it to the Lord. If he does not do this, he must be cut off from the people. Church today, we have an obligation to those who are not even here with us to share with them the principles and statutes contained in God's word. You see here, God says anybody that's numbered among you, no matter what they are, foreign or whatever, they still need to know that the rules apply to them. Church, do we share today, or are we really, we ought to be sharing today to the world that these same rules, precepts, principles, and statutes contained in God's word apply to them as well. That's not comfortable. That's not popular. That doesn't give us or the people we're trying to share this with a warm, fuzzy feeling. But we have an obligation. You see here Moses, or God speaks to Moses and through Moses to share this thought. And this same thought and principle, you all, you realize it still lives on today. Because God's word that he shared, even in times past, these things written are for us today. Doesn't the scripture teach us that in the New Testament? This isn't something just to be left way back here. I don't know if it was a, it wasn't a preacher. It was a young man I was speaking to uh, about a month ago who talked about the Bible, who we were talking about the scripture. And he said, yeah, but when it comes to that Old Testament, I just don't. He didn't say he was disregarding it. But he really didn't, didn't he didn't really he didn't really get into it. And I said, well, brother, what comes to what that needs needs to be is some teaching and some praying and meditation on the scripture. Because if you look at Jesus, I mean, it's wonderful. New Testament and Jesus, hallelujah, Paul, uh -huh. Jesus, Paul, and the apostles of the New Testament quoted the Old Testament. They quoted the scripture, the scroll. Jesus said it is written. Anytime he said it is written, where is it written? Go back and look at your Old Testament. In Hebrews, when it talks about those people of faith, when it talks about your Samson's and your Abraham, those are characters out of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So this young man wasn't saying, he wasn't disregarding or throwing it out, but there are some churches today who if it's, if it's anything before Matthew, they just kind of, they don't deal with it. They don't delve into it. Well, we the new church, all we need is Jesus. Well, we do need Jesus, but Jesus quoted, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that these things written before are for us now. So as God stated this principle in Leviticus 17, you all, it still applies today. Because you and I as Gentile people, those of us who are non-Jews, were a people who were far off or were far, far away. And just take a moment, if you would, please, just fix your eyes at the screen. And what you see here in this picture illustration, a far, far away, you see some dry, barren, destitute land. You see mountains and, and a rain way off in the distance. And you can see the sun, that, that greater light. That light that God set up to rule the daytime, beaming down, right? And we understand the sun gives us heat, ultraviolet rays, all those other things that, that sap our energy in the heat of summer, right? And when you and I are far, far away from God, this is where we are. A dry, destitute, a lonely place. And that's where we were as Gentiles being afar off. But thanks be to God for Jesus and his precious blood. Amen that brought us together, that broke down that middle wall of partition and brought us together with him. But I'm not ready to go there yet. So Christ, I mean Christ, God shares here, if anybody comes and does this, this is what they must do. Then he goes on to say in verse number 11, why God, uh, well, verse 10, I will be against any citizen of Israel or foreigner living with you who eats blood. I will cut off that person from the people. Why, God, what's so important about blood? I'll tell you. This is because the life of the body is in the blood. And I have given you rules for pouring that blood on the altar to remove your sins so you will, so you will belong to the Lord. Why? It is the blood that removes the sins because it is life. The, the life is in the blood. And you and I, could, we could do a whole little deep medical thing and talk about all the stuff in the blood, but I'll leave you to Google and your, your encyclopedia for that. But scripturally speaking, just for Sunday morning, venture down this road with me, if you will. 
God simply stated that the life is in the blood. That's why we're not to partake of it and drink it. And so any of these other people that go out and do this kind of stuff, the life is in the blood. Now let's take this to the natural for just a moment. Anybody here ever met or known someone who has lost a digit, finger or toe, or an appendage, but is still living today? You ever seen anybody? You ever seen some of our veterans we just had Memorial Day? Some of those who we don't celebrate Memorial Day, they're still here. But some who have made it back and come back, missing a neighbor too. Or on, or on. They're missing those appendages, but guess what? Because there's still blood flowing warm in their veins, they're still, what? Alive or living. So I can lose the peace, but if, I, if something happens, Ms. Sheila, and all my blood spills out, there's no more life for me, is there? Right? I mean, there ain't no zombies, no walking dead, and you know, all these people, zombie apocalypse, and these people with these stickers on their cars, it's so funny. You know, official zombie hunt and all this other kind of stuff. There's no life without the blood. So I can miss an appendage. I can lose an eye. Some of us, men folk, may shave day. We cut this part off and we cut our hair. All this other kind of stuff we can lose. But guess what? If we lose this, this stuff that's inside of us, there's no more life. So God says the life is in the blood. So that's why Jesus can give us the principle in the New Testament now, going back to the spiritual side of things, when he said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. If your eye does this, pluck it out. Why? Because I can still live missing an eye. Right? Ask Slick Rick. Ricky Walters, the rapper. He's got a patch over his eye today. Still living. Right? People lose all this other kind of stuff. But without the blood, there is no life. So it was important. So when Jesus came to give his life on Calvary, he didn't say, well, I'll just take my hands. I'll just, I can still walk and preach without my hands. I'll let the apostles be my hands. Or cut my feet off and they can, they can pal take me around on a pallet like that man that they lowered down. Mm -mm -mm. Jesus shed his blood for you and I, because the light is in the blood. That principle, y'all, got started right here because he said, and I'll repeat it. This is because, verse 11 in Leviticus 17, the life of the body is in the blood. I have given you rules for pouring that blood on the altar to remove your sins so that you belong to the Lord. It is the blood that removes the sins because it is life. So much so that when you waste blood or when you are killing something and blood is on the ground, he says, cover it up. Don't even leave it exposed. In verse 13, he says, but cover it up. If blood is still in the meat, the animal's life is still in it. So I give this command to the people of Israel, don't eat meat that still has blood in it because the animal's life is in his blood. And when his blood must be cut off. Okay? But we share here that the life is in the blood. That's a principle we need to keep with us as we go forward. The life is in the blood. So, so much so. That in Ephesians now, chapter 2, he says, In the past, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, you were spiritually dead because of your sins and the things you did against, the, against God. Mm. Yes, in the past, you lived the way the world lives, following the ruler of the evil powers that are above the earth. That same spirit yes. is now working in those who refuse to obey God. So lest anybody get confused, this isn't talking about the Holy Spirit. Number one, it's not capital. Number two, it's talking about a spirit that's inside people who refuse to obey God. The Holy Spirit is the third part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God. So the Holy Spirit wouldn't cause you and I to do what? To refuse to obey Him. So this is a different spirit. It says in the past, now, because this is Paul, as a Jew, pointing the finger, but he, he reminds his fellow Jewish brethren, in the past, all of us lived like them, trying to please our sinful selves and doing all the things our bodies and minds wanted. We should have suffered God's anger because of the way we were. We were the same as all other people. So lest any of this Jewish people in the audience be like, yeah, uh -huh, that's right, get them, Paul, jump on them. We hear the same thing in church. Yeah, pastor, get them, tell them about it. We were all acquainted with that foolish type of living. I was acquainted with that before I came to Jesus Christ, as were you. So lest we look down our sanctimonious nose at somebody, we all need a man, a savior in Christ Jesus. Because Paul said, we had our affiliation, don't, don't, don't get it. We were out there too. We did things that were contrary to the word and will of God. Yes, we did. So he says, but verse 4, but God's mercy, thanks be to God for mercy, is great. And he loved us very much, though we were spiritually dead. Why? 
because of the things we did against God. Yes. Our spiritual death is brought, on our, brought upon us by ourselves. Because it says we did things against God, disobedient. He gave us new life with Christ. You have been saved by God's grace, grace and faith. And he raised us up with Christ and gave us a seat with him in the heavens. He did this for those in Jesus Christ, or in Christ Jesus, so that for all future time he could show the very great riches of his grace by being kind to us in Christ Jesus. I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing or through faith. You didn't save yourselves. It was a gift from God. So it's not that all of a sudden I decided, or I just went over and said, what's this box? Ooh, that's a box over there that say faith. And I'm going to open it up, and it's just, wow, that's for me. It is a gift. Even the gift of faith comes from God. The fact that I have faith, God gave it to me. Hmm. Isn't it wonderful to have a Lord, a supreme master, a savior, who gives me what it is I need to succeed in life? He didn't say, Robert, go out and get it. Well, you got it. I mean, a job may give us some success, right? A job may give you a paycheck. It may give you some self-fulfillment and reward you to set another. But there are certain things you have to do before you get to that job that they don't provide. When I, when I signed my name, when I got to McDonald's way back when I was a young lad, the first time I filled out an application, there were certain things, that Sheila, I brought to the table before they ever taught me, Miss Becky, how to drop fries or how to make a Big Mac or how to fix the shake machine or how to do my six steps and take them. There were certain things I had to bring with me. Number one, I had to bring a certain amount of intellect. I had to be able to read and write. Ronald wasn't going to give me that, Miss Becky. He's not going to say, Robert, I'm going to hire you. Come on first, son. I'm going to teach you. We're going to get hooked on funds. No, no, no. That was the Dallas Independent School District's job to get me prepared for that. And guess what? Even before then, I had a mother and father who would instill some things in me so I could get to the school and get the education. But what I'm saying is, when I got to Ronald, he expected me to know some things. I was given what they called a station observation checklist, an SOC. Which meant that if I was going to make Big Macs, there were certain things I had to know. I had to be able to read that piece of paper. Then I had what they call an SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, as to how to prepare the things I fixed. And I tell y'all, when I talk about it, it was a science, Ray Kroc was a brilliant man. And all these other folks he had at Hamburg University that told me how much sauce and ketchup went on this thing. What amount of onions? How many pickles? I couldn't just say, ooh, I like pickles. I'm going to slap five on this burger. But then I give him one with two on it. Every one had to be uniform. That SOP taught me how to do that. My buns were lightly caramelized. Taught me that the top of the bun was called a crown and the middle was called a heel. And on the Big Macs, it had three pieces of bread. The middle one was called the club. That's what they call it. But I had to know these things, right? Ronald taught me how to make it, but I had to bring something to the table. Guess what? When I came to Christ, I had nothing to offer. Mm. Everything I needed was given to me of God. Mm. But unfortunately, in our world today, we bring that same sort of mindset that I have as a, well, a school taught me this. We bring that same thing to God thinking, well, I got all this. Now, God, here I am. I'm ready for you. Mm. Whatever it is I have is given to me of God. Mm. It says here that faith is what? It is a gift of God. Not of yourself. He's going to say, lest any of us, lest I boast. Lest I say I'm the cast me out. Lest I say I'm all that in a bag of chips and a deal. It has nothing to do with me. It's all given of him. And I have to remember that in my lostness, this is where I was. Out here, I had nothing. But I think, I, what can I offer God here? What can, I can't grow anything for him here. I don't have a cup of cold water to bring to him here. I am I am stuck out. I'm out here, you know, up the creek without a paddle. Man, ain't no creek or a paddle. I'm just out here. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I was far away. I need to be drawn. What's that song? Draw me near. Draw me near, oh, blessed Lord. I needed to be drawn near. But guess what? There was something that was hindering me. And what was it? I was spiritually dead. Why? Because I refused to obey God and his principles and precepts and statutes. I refused. It was me. I refused to obey. I thought I had it all together. But I refused to obey God and it put me in the position of being far, far away. Or as the scripture said, I was a far off. So he goes on to say, you have been saved by God's grace. Now, he raised us up with Christ, gave us a seat with him in the heavens, he did this for those in Christ so that all future time could show the very great riches of his grace by being kind to us in Christ Jesus. Now I mean that you've been saved by grace through belief. You didn't save yourselves. It was a gift from God. Now, it was not the result of your own efforts. So you can't brag about it. God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works. 
which God planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. He planned this in advance. God had something for us to do. When God created Adam, God said, oh my goodness, I have made this man. Now what I'm going to do with him. God already had something for him to do. Before there was an Adam, there was a garden for him to team. Right? Before, there were, before Adam named the animals, God had animals here for him to name. God had a job or some good works for the man to do. The same is true for you and I. He didn't put the cart before the horse, as it were, the proverbial horse. But God had a job set up, and he just needed someone to do that. So he made me. If you're not, if you are not born Jewish, meaning you're not a Jew, and I'm sorry, I wasn't born Jewish. If you're not born Jewish, you are the people the Jews call uncircumcised. Those who call you uncircumcised call themselves circumcised. Their circumcision is only something they themselves do to their bodies. Paul, that's just physical anyway. He says, but remember that in the past, you were without Christ. We were like some of those strangers and those aliens that he talked about in Leviticus, right? He says, you had no hope. Isn't that what this looks like? I'm out here. I mean, I'm out here. I'm stuck out. I don't have a canteen. I have no hope. He says, you had no hope, and you did not know God. I'm sorry, I skipped a point. It says, you were not citizens of Israel. You had no part in the agreement, excuse me, with the promise that God made to his people. You had no hope, and you did not know God. And that, that promise, that first covenant, is what Moses talks about with the blood also, about putting up, okay, here we go. So it says, we had no hope, but now. So all of that's gone, but now. And it's in Christ Jesus. So it's not but now, because you got an education. But now that you're married. But now that you have children. But now, no, but now in Christ Jesus. Yes. And it's not, see, and it's not so much knowing of Christ Jesus, but it says being in Christ Jesus. And see, when I'm in Christ, Trey Trey, Christ is in me. See, a lot of folks think that coming into this church and other church puts them in Christ Jesus. And as we say, we're praying for humility and discernment now. Some folks in some churches where Christ is not truly the head. Christ is, they hear the name Jesus, they read out of the they can read out of your Bible. But the, but the way it's being cut is not being rightly divided. It's not being shared according to the word of God. There's some trickery going on. There's some itching ears out there. So folks are giving folks what they want to hear. So let's not get it wrong. We have to do this in Christ Jesus. So it's not about knowing people. You know, you go to talk to somebody. We call it witnessing or saving souls, soul and whatever. Evangelizing. I'm going to go talk to you about Jesus. Yeah, I know about Jesus. I've heard. Now, okay, forget about all the hearing stuff. You can flip to your TV and see something crazy going on. So, Ooh, look at that joker jumping on the tape and stop and watch that program for 30 minutes. You're looking at a show. You're not trying to hear it. Granted, perfectly, that's not just a show you're looking at. But anyway, you, you say, well, I heard somebody say, Jesus, I know you may know of but does he know you? Are you in him and is he in you? So this is what the scripture says. Read it. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you were far away from God, but are you, excuse me, you who were far away from God are brought near, here again, through the blood of Christ's death. So how am I brought in? It's through the blood of his death. When we read just a moment, or a few moments ago in Hebrews, our New Testament scripture passage. It says, when Christ came, verse 9 11, Christ came as high priest, good thing we now have entered the greater, more perfect. He says, Christ entered the most holy place only once and for all time. He did not take with him the blood of goats and calves, but it says he sacrificed, or his sacrifice was his own blood. By it, he set us he set us free from sin forever. He didn't have to do it over and over and over. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a cow are sprinkled on the people who are unclean. And this makes their bodies clean again. How much more is done by the blood of Christ? He offered himself through the eternal spirit as a perfect sacrifice to God. Notice, his blood will make our consciences pure from the useless acts so we may serve the living God. Anybody here ever perform or be performing some useless acts? You've done something you realize, like, man, I don't, you know, you did it, why did I do that? We're performing useless acts. Things that when we talk about useless acts, those are things that God doesn't bit more care about. But we think we call ourselves doing it what? For God. Yeah, the Lord told me, you're just doing something to make you feel good. Or because you saw it on TV or you heard somebody else was doing that, I think that's a good idea. I'm going to do it too. Okay, whatever. Useless acts. For this reason, 
Christ brings a new agreement from God to his people. Those who are called by God can now receive the blessings he's promised. Blessings that will last forever. They can have those things because Christ died so that people who lived under the first agreement could be set free from sin. Now, who was that living under the first agreement? The Jewish people, right? The first agreement. But they had to be set free from sin. Why? Because they kept killing bulls and goats and bulls and goats and bulls and goats and calves and sheep and give me two turtle doves and give me an incense offering. Give me a grain. They had to keep on, keep on, keep on. And they sinned. They were still under bondage of sin. When there is a will, it must be proven that the one who wrote that will is dead. Mm. A will means nothing while the person is alive. So Jesus had to die in order for us to inherit, right? What we call, I believe the scripture says, heirs and joint heirs. You don't inherit, at least you shouldn't, until somebody's dead. That's the whole part of the problem that the prodigal son, that he wants to inherit him, and his dad was still in. Like, boy, are you really, do you really want me gone that quick? You know, how did dad say, how you know I'm not going to need some of this to live off of, to take care of you, son, but you want to take something right now? Okay. Mm -hmm. A will means nothing while the person is alive. It can be used only after the person dies. You know another reason why it can't mean anything while the person is alive? People can change you while they live. They may have had you in there, but all of a sudden something happens and they see that you're not living right and you start squandering. Oh, you know, I, I love both of them, but I'm not going to leave the both my grandkids. I'm going to leave it to this one grandkid and help him because this one right here, he'll, he'll, he'll sell the shoes off his feet and then complain at the ground his eye. Doing the wrong thing, right? So while I'm alive, that will can be what? Changed. This is why even the first agreement could not begin without blood to show death. Why? First, Moses told all the people every command in the law. Next, he took the blood of calves and mixed it with water. Then he used red wool and a branch of hyssop plant to sprinkle it on the book of law and on all the people. He said, this is the blood that begins the agreement that God commanded you to obey in the same way, Moses sprinkled blood on the holy tent over all the things used in worship. The law says almost, almost everything must be made clean by blood. And sins cannot be forgiven without blood to show death. So sins cannot be forgiven without blood. Why? Because God said life is worth in the blood. So Jesus, back now to Ephesians. Jesus, through his blood, brought us near. And verse 14 says, Christ himself is our peace. He made both Jewish people and those who are not Jews one people. They were separated as if they, there were a wall between them. But Christ broke down the wall of hate by giving his own body. The Jewish law had many commands and rules, but Christ ended that law for us. Now, for God's people, God told them what to do. They still have to do that because God told them that, but for you and I, who are far off, we've been brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ. His purpose was to make the two groups of people become one new people in him and in this way make peace. It was also Christ's purpose to end the hatred between the two groups, to make them into one body and bring them back to God. Christ did all this when with his death on the cross. Christ came and preached peace to you who were far away from God and those who and to those who were here. Because we all need a Savior, Jesus Christ. So for our Jewish brethren and sisters who say, I got the law. I'm doing the feast. I'm just they think that that's enough. Christ said, I came to preach it to the Gentile, those who are far off, uh, and to y'all who are near who. Jesus says, I am still the key. I said in John 14 and 6 that I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the way. It's me. It's me or it's nothing. So for those of us who are far, far away, because guess what? Even some of God's, some of God's chosen people, some of his Jewish people are far away today. They're in a dry, a desperate, a desperate place because they won't give in and humble themselves to believe in faith in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. They called it blasphemous that he called himself the Son of God. They called it blasphemous that he counted himself equal with God. And they thought they were doing God's work when they killed him on the cross. And in a way, they were. Amen. Somebody had to do it. I mean, I'm sorry, I feel sorry for Judas. Guess what? People say, well, Judas drew the short He had it. No, he didn't have to. Judas, up until he did that, until he sold him out, had a choice that could be made. If it wasn't Judas, it would have been someone. But it didn't have to be Judas. Judas chose to do that and betrayed our Savior. And yes, his blood was shed. And oh, the blood of Jesus. That song we just sung a few minutes ago. And nothing but the blood of Jesus. It was Jesus' blood that draws you and I near. 
that brings us as a people who are far, far away in a dry, desperate, and a dank place. It draws us near and brings us into fellowship Amen. with Christ Jesus. And aren't we grateful for that? And guess what, as the song says, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thanks be to God, that's all it requires. He didn't say that Jesus shed his blood, jumped through a hoop, threw up some Hail Mary, sprinkled some water. It said, through his blood. So church, nothing but the blood of Jesus that washes you and I and makes us white as snow. That's all it takes is his blood. It's nothing else. And it's that, that's so simple. And I didn't even do that. There's nothing you could do. No, you couldn't do it. It was his blood. But guess what? We have to give in and give over to his spirit, capital S now, and get rid of that spirit of the air that makes us refuse to do what? To obey him. That's what we want to do, right? To show him that I appreciate what he did. I need to believe. I need to follow. I need to do what? Disciple and try to bring someone else along. But guess what? There are others who are still far away. Even though Christ has come and brought us together, they have to accept the finished work of Calvary. Right? They have to come and be washed in that blood to be made white as snow. Because there's nothing but the blood. There's none of those useless acts you do out there. But I do this. I'm doing it. I come up and cut the church's yard. I've known people who say that. They don't come into church. Well, I cut the church's yard for you. I've been doing it for 20 years. That's a wonderful work. The church appreciates it. But that's not going to get you in the blood. I mean, it is. What you do is a blessing for the church. Well, I cut the property over there. I live next door to the church. I cut their grass. I don't charge them nothing because I think I should do that. That's God's people. Wonderful. Thank you, brother. We appreciate it. But Lord forbid, somebody at that church never goes and catches that man while he's out there riding that board and tries to share the gospel with him. Because he thinks, you know, in his mind, and granted, I didn't come and tell him, well, brother, God sure appreciate that. I can't wait to see you. It's nothing to do with me. He thinks, in his mind, right? Because he's ruled by the, the, spirit, the prince of the spirit of the air. That's, that's tricking him, right? Discerning. He didn't have any spiritual discernment. So he thinks about what he's doing is doing something. Why? Because that's what we do in life. Say that man is married and has a wife. When he does his honeydews and does some good things for her, she may bake him a pie, right? She appreciates what he did. He thinks it's the same in the spiritual realm. There's nothing we can do. God already did this before we ever got here, man. We looked at Genesis before Adam got here. There was a garden. All that we need has been done. And that's what we read in the scripture. These things before, Christ got us ready to do it, but the world already needed a savior. Okay? There are people who already need a savior. There are people besides those folks in Benin, Africa, who need to hear the gospel. God knew that. That's why he sent a J. Vernon McGee years ago. That's why he sent somebody who could understand that language and do this years ago. They're not just now coming up with broadcast. It's already been done. Somebody's sharing it when? Now. But he did that for you and me. So for us not to be Far, far away. We want to be drawn in by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And be reminded, as the song we heard saying, that it's nothing but the blood of Jesus, church. Let's not be fooled and tricked with all these Johnny and Janet come ladies who want to tell us this and share this with us, and they've got a new thing to show us. God may be, as the song says, God may be doing a new thing, but he's still using the same material to do it. Right? There are new people. There are people in Benin who, in the language of Fountain Bay, are hearing the gospel. So he's doing that in a new way, but it's the same message that he preached to you and me. Amen? He's not telling them, oh, you can eat people. You can do this and then do that. Uh -uh. The same Jesus that helps us over in America is the same Jesus that helps them over in Benin, Africa. Or over in Iraq, the people we prayed for. Or over in, in the Southern Islands, the people we prayed for last week, right? It's the same gospel, the same message. And it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. So let's be drawn near. Amen? And not far away on this morning. Our final selection of the day. Be glorified. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 shares with us what thought. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back and read it. Meshita said, grow in grace. What did we just read in here? Uh, Paul said what? We've been saved by what? Grace. grace. So let's grow in it. We've been looked to grow in grace. Think about it. Grace, you know, people say the lack of God's riches and Christ's grace. Number one, we've been given something, right? Grace. I didn't deserve it. I've been given. But to grow in that, to, to grow in more of what I don't deserve, why? By knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him before glory now. But do that, I will grow in grace and in knowledge. That God would be what? Glorified. 